Thank you very much, uh, Judy, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to some. Um, I am Yasmin Shawaf, and I am the Protection Advocacy Coordinator for Oxfam's Global Humanitarian Team, and I also co-chair the advocacy working group of the Global Protection Cluster. I am very excited about today's session, especially that it's going to be in a different format that of a talk show. So I will be talking to guests uh, today and I will also be hearing from everyone in the chat, whether you want to also um, have a um, put a question in the chat or on or raise your hand so you can also ask a question. You can do it throughout the session and you do not have to wait for a QA. Um, so uh, today's session is about uh, or talk show is about community led protection advocacy um and it is in uh, and this talk show is presented to you in collaboration between the advocacy working group of the global protection cluster and the community led protection task team of the cluster as well so thank you very much for joining us and uh, we hope that uh, you will find this uh, session uh, useful just uh, as an introduction to this uh, session, I've had um, we've had a lot of uh, preparations, thoughts, discussions among the task team uh, members and the advocacy working group, and uh, this is also today very much a um, summary of uh, those different discussions, including a session where we brainstormed on. Um, the best practices for community-led uh, protection advocacy. Last night, uh, I didn't uh, sleep uh, much uh, because I'm based in Beirut and there was uh, some uh, a lot of bombing. So I also got uh, more time to think about community-led uh, protection uh, advocacy and about our guests, about their different experiences. And maybe also it hit me at some point during the um, long night that I would not want anyone to speak uh, on my behalf or demand for my rights as much as I want to do it myself. Um, so I think this is also where we need to start the discussion about uh, community-led protection advocacy. As I felt yesterday, I'm sure hundreds of thousands and millions of people uh, uh, are feeling uh, across uh, different countries uh, around uh, the world. Um, and now enough with the sad stories and uh, I'm very happy to have guests uh, with us today who will share with us um, success stories, best practices, things they have done in their um, different organizations, in their different uh, uh, contexts. And uh, until the end of the session, there will be interaction with the audience. So as I mentioned, please do not hesitate to um, put up your questions or raise your hand um, to ask them. How can organizations learn from past experiences to adopt and support different uh, types of uh, contexts? Uh, we have seen over the past year a bit of a new approach or new trend in community-led uh, advocacy for protection. And this is very much also as a result of the use of social media. So we s still see uh, meetings with local authorities, um, uh, advocacy for increased access uh, with uh, uh, local actors. And at the same time, we are seeing young people demanding uh, their rights, the rights they're entitled to on social media, directly addressing the international community, addressing human rights mechanisms and uh, um, uh, calling for increased protection for themselves, for their families, and uh, also for their uh, communities. Today, our guests are um, 
people who work with communities who are in um, uh, different uh, countries supporting community-led advocacy for protection and also uh, who have made a lot or many observations and learnings around uh, the topic. We have with us today Jihan Ta'ala, who is the protection manager for Utopia, an organization uh, from Lebanon. We have also Lina Rebollo, the deputy director of uh, projects in Apoyar in Colombia. We have Augustin Titi Rutanuka, the coordinator from CEDIR and DRC in the Democratic Republic uh, uh, of Congo. Um, and finally, uh, Lawrence Pink, the senior research advisor with uh, Civic. Thank you very much, all four of you, for uh, joining us uh, today in this uh, talk show and agreeing to share your experience and observations um, with the uh, audience of the Global Protection Forum session today. I will start with a simple question that is, what are some of the examples? Perhaps I'm looking at you, Jehan, and next to you, I can see also Sara from Utopia, um, with whom uh, we have worked a lot in the task team, the community-led protection task team. So Jehan and uh, Sara, tell us a little bit about the different examples, uh, the, um, the efforts that you have uh, supported, and uh, what can you tell us uh, about them? Over to you, Jehan and Sara. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Yasmin, for the introduction. And thank you, Julie, also. Uh, actually, for Utopia, we started working with the community since 2014. We started as a CBP uh, intervention. We work with community structure. Uh, the first example I want to uh, to give it, the, the, the big campaign that we have, have it with uh, our community structure, that is the right to access. It was uh, actually made by women group and youth group from Tripoli area in the north of Lebanon. And this was to, uh, uh, let's say, highlight the needs of the PWD and elderly in accessing the service, uh, the medical services actually in, in Lebanon, because we don't have uh, accessibility for those people to SDC, the social development centers, for for example, and for all the PhDs that we are having in Tripoli. And also the right to access the education for uh, children and for Syrian refugees, mainly for higher education in Lebanon. So those group actually made a, a big campaign where they highlighted the needs of those people. They, they give a flyer to the SDC. We shoot uh, uh, some videos for the need for those people. And we uh, insist on the Ministry of uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Moza, Ministry, social Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, to to sh to um, meet the director there and to say the needs for those people and where we can support them um, to better have access to those uh, elderly and PWD. The second one was uh, Sawarbina. It was uh, we grew up together. It was mainly raised by women in the Tripoli area, this was to uh, yani highlight the tension between Syrian and Lebanese in the, in the first decade of uh, the Syrian revolution. And uh, actually, uh, Lebanese and Syrian female uh, distributed uh, some uh, keychain and they did a letter on a WhatsApp circulated between their community to say that we grew up together, Syrian no Lebanese, and you know, Lebanese no Syrian, we have many relatives together. So, uh, yes. In addition, we have many campaigns not related directly to protection, but it was actually raised uh, um, non uh, conventionally from uh, the groups. Let's say we had a, uh, a campaign called uh, Tripoli and Alhamra. Hamra is a uh, is a city in the 
Yes, ma. This is was directly uh, to the minister. The tourist uh, ministry, and uh, after that, they, they we had the exchange people from those two uh, cities. Actually, it was from Balbak and Tripoli to to say to them that we have many cities in many um, <coughs> in Tripoli that can be showed. We have uh, all things that to uh, us. Traditional, Traditional uh, uh, sites. sites, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Jihan. So I can see that uh, maybe when we are talking about uh, community-led advocacy for protection, it's a set of activities that aim to influence stakeholders and these stakeholders are very much different in nature. You mentioned things related to governments. You mentioned things related to uh, even community, other community members, a community uh, working with another uh, community. Um, so thank you very much uh, for these uh, examples. Uh, I'm sure others have also uh, many examples, uh, whether from uh, uh, Colombia or uh, DRC. Lina, would you like to share with us any specific example from uh, your experience? Gracias, uh, Jasmine. Thank sí, you, Jasmine. Uh, en términos de nuestra experiencia, Indeed. Uh, when it comes to our experience, a esta pregunta específicamente. Surrounding this specific question, we have accompanied groups of women. In this case, at first, we were strengthening knowledge on rights, on how to demand your rights in order to communicate with decision makers and to advocate for topics of interest to the communities. In the end, they were effective. Not all the cases are successful or as successful as we, as we wish to. However, we do develop the capacity of communities so that they can demand the rights before the state, who are the first to protect their citizens. So, we had schools, leadership schools, schools focusing on rights, and these schools have allowed women to have greater access to demanding their rights, and this translates into effective actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lina, for this uh, interesting example. As you said, the stakeholder here is the government, and they are responsible for the protection of their um, uh, res uh, uh, citizens and everyone in the country. So I think the best thing about this uh, talk show is that we are getting to hear about all these experiences with zero commercials. So that's uh, a, a different uh, situation than the talk shows on um, TV. From what uh, Lina and uh, Jihan and Sara mentioned, we see that there are many successful examples and practical examples in the contexts where um, they work. But is it the case for all contexts? What do we consider as a context that is conducive for community-led protection advocacy, if such a thing exists, or are all contexts conducive? I would like to hear from you, Lauren, about your experience and what are the things that you are seeing in different contexts that you would say, okay, this is where we would like to support or community health protection advocacy can be supported or just organically it's also uh, working. Thank you. Thanks, Yasmin. Um, so I think ideally there is 
some political will on the part of um, security forces and government to improve their behavior, some acknowledgement of their legal obligations to protect civilians. Uh, that certainly makes it easier to have advocacy successes with them. Um, and also mechanisms established for uh, the accountability of armed actors. If there are those formal mechanisms, um, then I think we see more successes or easier successes in our protection advocacy um, or the protection advocacy of communities that we support. Um, also, I mean, an environment where civil society organizations have been able to organize and work without constant or persistent threat from armed actors. Um, that certainly facilitates this type of work. Uh, the challenging reality is that at best, there's usually only partial support for from state actors for, for these types of things in areas where we need this protection work the most, where we need community-based protection advocacy the most. Uh, but um, I'm thinking of a recent example. So we um, we released a protection of civilians trends report recently looking at developments in 2023. And for that report, we had one spotlight article looking at the work of three civil society organizations in the Sahel. And, um, and the civil society leaders stressed that, um, that it's, an increasingly challenging environment to do their work in the Sahel, uh, that the national narrative on the conflict intentionally tries to erase uh, civilian protection concerns, civilian harm as a part of the discussion on the conflict, and that there's a decreasing uh, support of money from presence of international actors, uh, and that it's in increasingly difficult to use the vocabulary of international law uh, to push for protection gains. Um, and, uh, and so that they've had to use a more contextualized, um, localized vocabulary to advocate for protection concerns. And, um, and so I think, you know, that's an environment where we don't really see a lot of the conducive factors, but, but, um, but community organizations are still working and finding ways to navigate, um, to navigate around the lack of conducive environment and, um, and find ways to engage national actors uh, around their protection concerns. And I think um, we, see, you know, we see some bigger successes, but even where we don't see some of those landmark or bigger successes, bringing security forces together with communities to discuss their protection concerns at a minimum, the dialogues I think can help communities better understand the capabilities and limitations of security forces. Um, and for security forces, it can help humanize civilians. So for example, we see some context where the security forces view civilians as complicit with the activities and behavior of non-state armed groups, you know, as, as like they see civilians as likely supporting them, those non-state armed groups. They don't really understand how and why civilians behave the way they do. Um, and so therefore they view civilian civilians, I'd say with suspicion. So you know, at a very basic level, even just having these interactions, um, supporting these interactions, this protection advocacy between communities and uh, and security forces at civic, we see uh, learning on on behalf of all the parties and um, an ability sort of dispelling the misconceptions of security forces about civilians. Uh, and about their behavior in ways that can lead to less uh, protection concerns, fewer protection concerns. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lauren. And maybe this also uh, makes us um, think a bit about like when you said that in some contexts there are limitations on what terminology um, uh, we use as uh, organizations. Maybe here communities have a bit of an advantage since they don't use much of the jargon uh, that uh, organizations we use, but also maybe in other situations it can put uh, them at risk if they are um, uh, just so it's a process uh, perhaps. Uh, I think there's certainly the best place to contextualize, you know, that the protection language and and find a way that um, 
they can continue to advocate without raising risks and, and see progress. Exactly. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lauren. And uh, for those uh, directly also working with uh, communities, anything to comment on uh, the overview provided by uh, Lauren? Many interesting uh, things uh, there. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the translation. Uh, Jihan, Orlina, Augustin, would you like to add anything about uh, what contexts have you seen are uh, conducive for uh, such uh, work or the community-led protection advocacy? <coughs> Uh, 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 merci beaucoup. Yeah, Yasin. Thank you very much, Yasmin. I have some examples to share with you. Apart from what we have just said, as for the advocacy actions, uh, and let me give you an example regarding the alliance of. Uh, community protection structures with uh, community leaders in uh, the village of uh, Nkihande, Degu, Mulenge, and Mashuba. Uh, these villages that I have just mentioned, uh, the po their populations leave their area and go to the market of Malungi. And most of the time, they are confronted with their rights violation especially women and girls on their way to the market. So this community protection entity has organized an advocacy session with local authorities uh, and community leaders. They went to visit the military of the army and asked for their support. So the military welcomed their, them and decided to escort these communities during market days. So in return, the military said that, well, it's too much risk, but the population accepted to create or to contribute at 200 Congolese francs to support the military to help them cover that distance. And these are very long distance. And this facilitated uh, things and allowed the population to benefit from something in order to ensure their survival. The second example was the one of a protection, community protection structure as well. And uh, that structure conducted an advocacy with regards to the displaced people in a village called Muketi to uh, Plateau Villa. And that structure works at Moravia because the civilians were forced to leave their villages and those populations were uh, already demonstrating their interest to go back to their villages. But those villages were occupied by the armed groups and uh, the armed groups were opposed to those populations. So the entity contacted the local authorities and at their level, the local authorities, together with that local entity, conducted an advocacy, a security meeting with the military and uh, have explained the advantages as well as the achievements for the integration of the community in the village. And uh, these, uh, uh, military were able, had to leave those villages to allow the communities or members of the village to come and settle. So these are examples that I can share with you, and it was a success. Uh, and we have currently this diversity in the movement and cohabitation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Augusta. And we have a comment actually in the chat box about the different uh, types of uh, uh, contexts uh, as well as stakeholders when it's a government uh, or a military rule we have we had we also heard from augusta uh, and uh, lauren mentioning um non-state armed groups so these are the different uh, types of uh, of um, contexts and stakeholders and uh, 
we go back to the maybe initial idea of being flexible and and not coming with one size fits all for um uh, this type of work uh, jihan i see you and sara are uh, nodding uh, do you want to add something actually yasmin as we said that every advocacy initiative has its own uh, stakeholder so this is also impacted on the way of uh, يعني how they will react accordingly to their to the to the thing that they want to highlight so circumstances it, it really depends uh, especially when we say let's let's say uh, now in uh, what's happening in lebanon so we cannot what's happening in the lebanon especially in the south of lebanon so we cannot uh, uh, see people going and have negotiation with israel and see what what they have to do so uh, this mm. this uh, impacted what what uh, their ability to do so uh, second people they don't react like we do as ngo and ingos so they react in a harmonized and holistic ways to uh, uh, to uh, let's say to address their protection threats or the things that they want to to do with better uh, for sure there will be biases that will play a role as well as their prior priorities and their internal social dynamics but this is not always neg negative because also we have seen in some instance that this razor play uh, plays a positive role as in their knowledge of vulnerabilities within communities, push them to advocate for the rights and well-being of the less visible groups that might also not uh, make it uh, the, to the top of the agenda of the NGOs, as, as I already said. So it's not a, a box for them. It's open for them. They can react as the way they, they, they say they saw it. It's the best for them or applicable for them. Thank you very much, uh, Jihan. Uh, these are very interesting uh, insights uh, and uh, also enlightening on the uh, context uh, in which you work uh, in uh, Lebanon. Any final thoughts, Lina, before we jump into um, the main question of the NGO support that could be provided? Thank you, Jasmine. Precisely, I fully agree with what Lauren and Dehan said recently, and uh, taking into account what said Dehan, communities or uh, stakeholders react based on the circumstances, on the contexts with their protection strategies. And a key point, in my opinion, that I want to contribute to the, this discussion is that sometimes organizations and hum humanitarian organizations or NGOs think that we already have the solutions for the community uh, uh, face uh, of community issues, and that we already have uh, uh, some uh, safe safeguards uh, to protect them. Uh, from uh, uh, others, uh, Colombia and uh, Arauca specifically, well, we are a territory wherein we have non-state armed uh, groups and uh, therefore communities have generated a long, a wide range of uh, um, protecting factors. For instance, uh, stopping uh, uh, children from going to schools uh, because they could be kidnapped or not going outside at a given time uh, of the day, not following some uh, ways to go out because they can be exposed to risks. So it all depends on the context and also on the communities, the type of language we have to use not only to protect the community, but also to protect ourselves and to prevent any threat 
uh, to be uh, implemented by other actors. So this is in agreement with what Lawrence said. Uh, th in this way, we can provide them with information and accompany the different communities in their processes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Lina. And in the chat, many um, ideas and uh, also reflections on different uh, contexts, whether from uh, we see some from uh, India um, uh, about child protection, child rights, uh, and uh, other uh, examples, and how also the fact that community-led structures and uh, advocacy uh, as a result are organic to communities, um, which uh, here actually brings me to the question again to you, Lina, is, okay, we are mentioning, uh, there was mention in the chat that the structures or the advocacy efforts are organic to the, to the communities, they exist. So what do NGOs or how can NGOs support such uh, efforts and uh, structures? Well, Jasmine, I think that based on my experience as a humanitarian worker linked to a local NGO, and since I live in a context in which we have violence, dynamics, armed conflicts, and uh, human mobility, I think that the role to be played to be played by uh, NGOs is to uh, uh, support communities in a comprehensive and participative way. This doesn't mean not only providing funds uh, for any actions, but also strengthening the community autonomy. NGOs can support uh, them by providing uh, communities with tools in order to understand the risks they are running uh, and they uh, by teaching them how to strengthen their capacities and how uh, by reducing their vulnerabilities for instance by strengthening their knowledge on root or activation or protection mechanisms based on the uh, legislation uh, in force in the country. And this will allow them to request uh, timely replies, responses, and also uh, that these responses be effective in case of uh, threats. Another important uh, aspect is the strengthening of community networks together with institutions and organizations involved. We should be a sort of a bridge to uh, uh, strengthen uh, leaders, uh, partnerships, and community uh, members, uh, and also the youth should be uh, should uh, establish networks with uh, local actors and the other. Uh, local organizations. In Arauca, for instance, we have seen how uh, mutual uh, support can be provided by these networks by launching uh, early uh, alerts, uh, early warnings, and this facilitates a rapid response phase two threats. In addition, the role of NGOs uh, is uh, uh, being facilitators between the community and the state. Uh, as I already said before, we cannot uh, remove this component, the state component from this equation. So this can promote the uh, creation of accessible uh, routes accompanying the population in terms of uh, uh, advocacy for the purpose of collective security. However, uh, the responsibility for protecting communities uh, is not only in the hands of the affected communities. It is the state who uh, 
should also guarantee such protection. NGOs should not only empower uh, uh, communities and uh, building uh, uh, resilience among community members. They uh, should also work so that the state will be accountable in these terms. And the communities should also rely on the support and the commitment uh, uh, by the state organizations in order to respond in a, an equitable and effective manner. Thank you. Accountability. Very important uh, uh, word, uh, Lina, and uh, a lot has been uh, discussed around also how NGOs can support accountability mechanisms and promote accountability mechanisms as a way to support locally led efforts. So thank you very much, uh, Lina. I think um, there is uh, not much uh, to add uh, to this, but uh, I assume that you have seen in the chat also there is uh, Adriana. She mentioned uh, something. Now, uh, my Spanish is not superb, but I understood that she was talking about a process. Do we have a process-oriented um, support rather than a project-oriented um one, uh, which brings me uh, to ask uh, the rest of our uh, guests uh, today what also they think could be done to support uh, uh, this uh, type uh, of work. I can no longer uh, see Jihan, but I assume uh, she is still uh, with us. I will jump uh, to you, uh, um, Ah, sorry, I see now Jehan. Jehan and uh, Sarah, uh, do you have uh, anything that you would like to reflect on also how to support uh, um, or how NGOs can support such initiatives and efforts? Actually, Yasmin, this is, uh, it's like a play of power. Uh, the question is who has the power? And actually, we all do have a certain amount of power. Uh, the community has its own power. It, 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 they know their vulnerabilities, their needs. Uh, the difference between NGOs, how NGOs, how local NGOs can uh, uh, can uh, can uh, 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 can intervene or can help, and the difference, uh, and with I NGOs, how can intervene and help? The difference is that we can access the community faster than I NGOs since we are apart from uh, for uh, in this community. So yes, we can build. Uh, we have that kind of uh, trust built over the years, so we can access the community. They uh, they trust that we are listening to them. Uh, I NGOs, I think they can work on uh, their strength among uh, order to to uh, to. Uh, to let our our voice be 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 heard, yani, uh, internationally, internationally, they can uh, use their power to to uh, to create an enabling environment for us and for protection. What they can do to support local NGOs and then local NGOs, how they how they can support community structures. Uh, so yes, everyone has uh, a certain amount of power. It's like uh, how can we how do we how do we use it for the favor of uh, the community? Yes. I think uh, you mentioned something, Sarah, that makes me directly look at uh, Lauren as uh, our only speaker from an international NGO. And here I will ask you, uh, Lauren, how do you think the or the role of an international NGO should be different uh, to ensure adequate support and uh, uh, not actually doing harm or undermining local efforts? Um, so I think uh, change requires movement of many levers at many levels. And, um, you know, just as, as Jihan said, um, then INGOs have maybe a particular role to play, but not overstepping their role. Um, if communities are at the core and should be at the core of identifying the change they want to see, the objectives, uh, I think INGOs can help advance those objectives um, by identifying opportunities at the national capital or regional or, for example, United Nations level um, that could, um, where they can bring those community objectives 
um, help advocate for change at that regional or UN level that then would support um, communities uh, in, you know, in different areas uh, within, within the country where they're working, um, you know, and, and changing those levers at, at other levels that are going to facilitate protection work um, in communities. I think, um, you know, ideally, uh, communities can have a place directly on the stage at the regional level and the international level, but we know that that isn't always possible or there's the doors are not always open for them or there may be risks to them, um, you know, appearing directly in different forums and formats. Um, we know there's been backlash, for example, against community um, uh, community members who participated in security council sessions. They've been targeted afterwards. So I think basically INGOs with communities can help assess, you know, when it's safe for communities directly to voice their own concerns or when INGOs can play a role of being an intermediary um, to prevent uh, targeted action and backlash against them. Um, and can also, INGOs I think can also facilitate maybe cross community or cross border coalitions on, um, on issues uh, that are common between different communities or across countries. Um, to create a platform where uh, where community-based organizations can learn from each other and have that platform to engage um, virtually or um, by coming together to meet somewhere where there might not be an opportunity without INGO support to do that. I think you mentioned, yes, mean do no harm. Uh, and I had referenced our, our um, 2023 POC trends report um, in looking at trends from 2023, we saw that um, that international organizations had increasingly pushed risk onto local local organizations uh, without providing them with adequate security support or even the same types of security training and support that they were giving to international staff, um, and also that pitifully small amounts of money were going directly to national and local uh organizations and cso's um and so i'd say you know at a baseline if we're thinking about do no harm um better supporting local organizations community-based organizations um uh financially directly and um ensuring that we're not pushing risks onto them uh when we ask them to take on action or in um i think for us it, it's always basically the community deciding if it's safe and effective to do something and what it is safe and effective to do and what the objectives are. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. And um, Augustin, Cédier a toujours donné de bons exemples. Alors, uh, comment pensez-vous Augustin que... has always given good examples. So how do you think NGOs can support the advocacy actions uh, uh, led by the communities? Well, thank you very much, Yasmin. And as my colleague just said, there are so many things that we can do, uh, support, that we can provide uh, to improve the work. We identified first capacity of building for protection and in the analysis of uh, action risks, because in order to take actions, we need to analyze first, and negotiations as well. We need to assist them uh, in that vein. Secondly, we also thought that we need to provide more information if the resources here, resources mean that in an area you can find actors who are there working and they have a specific mandate regarding the operations. Uh, there's a need. My colleague talked about networking. We need to know these structures and the other actors in the area that can help because there are actions uh, that are so advocated. And when this is the case, they have a specific mandate 
uh, other uh, partners can also help. This is what we can do with the organizations that are here to facilitate and help. But we need to teach them how to do the monitoring because when monitoring is done well, this will help identify how to do the advocacy thing. Third, we need facilitation to reach targets. How? Simply, we are in rural areas, and in rural areas, there are so uh, many things, so many places that are uh, very uh, far. And sometimes the advocacy uh, is not led to the end. So it's up to us. Maybe we can try and get into a, a territory, but we should be there to facilitate. We can have a rendezvous, we can have a consultation. Uh, we can try to do some liaison to do the advocacy, but if it's at the provincial level, it's still the same. You will find structures at the national level that is very limited, uh, incapable of uh, doing the advocacy because of the distance and the other uh, parts that separate them. So the organization supporting them should be also there to play that role and facilitate everything. And as an organization to assist, we should also facilitate experience sharing because as we are doing right now, there are issues that differ from one place to the other. But in order to bring this population into seeing how we can support them more, uh, they need to be aware on how the work can be done. And finally, as actor, we should maintain the bond between uh, the structures because uh, when we see they are not able to do so, uh, we should be there to, to see how we can fulfill this gap. And we can also approach them by giving them solutions so that at one point in time they can uh, do better. As my colleague was saying earlier, we are not the ones uh, who know more as compared to the populations. Uh, they know the way to, to proceed, they know what's different. So there too, we need to identify these plans and strengthen their capacities and uh, uh, live up to the challenges. I don't know, uh, Contexts are different, but here in DRC, a great part of the population are in rural areas. Even though we intervene, our interventions will still come uh, with a little bit of delay. So when we are prepared, this will help them face the challenges ahead. Uh, so in a nutshell, this is what I think, and this is what we can uh, offer to the national structures that we can that we support and i want to add one last thing there are difficult issues very difficult issues but we should first try to analyze them but because uh, we can try to go even further. In our context, you will see that this is a political context and uh, in political uh, matters, you need to know who you will address the advocacy uh, session. You need to know, uh, you, you need to have a, a political leader who is interested. It's like we know someone who's pulling the strings. Even at the territory level, at the region level, they are not the ones who have the authority. But there's always someone behind pulling the string, maybe a political figure. And 
In order to do all of that, you understand you need much more funds, you need much more actions. Uh, and this is what I can say. Okay, thank you, August, Augustin. Um, Hervé agrees with you. These efforts are very important in DRC. So thank you very much, Augustin. Augustin mentioned something super important that is to help by removing the challenges. So one of those things that were already mentioned uh, was accountability and um, now, uh, also, Augusta mentioned to remove challenges. I was, um, I see there is a hand uh, from uh, the audience, uh, someone who wants uh, to speak. Uh, Omar, do you want to go ahead? I'm not sure, Julie, if we can uh, unmute uh, the participants. Yes, thank you. I'm unmuted. I was trying, but it was not working. First, uh, it's a pleasure to be among you all. Um, I'm Omar. I'm from Oxfam, Palestine. And bear with me because I have a lot to say, to be honest. And just to say that um, this is a very uh, deep conversation. And I think we're only being super aware about the implications uh, the past, what, uh, five years, I think before we start asking, like, how can organizations, um, international organizations get in to help um, a local community-led advocacy or organizations or activists, I think we need to be clear with ourselves first as an organization, what are we doing there? Uh, how do we define protection? How do we local communities define protection? We need to be very transparent in what can we offer, especially when it comes to protection, instead of just putting people in the front line and then leaving them alone there or doing it when, you know, it's best for the international organizations themselves. And also, and to be honest, I find the, the approach that we do, you know, INGOs in general, when you talk about local partners, the first thing comes to mind is capacity building. And to be honest, I'm done with that. Like this needs to die now. <laughs> Honestly, even when we do needs assessment, it's based on what we can offer and like what money we have to do with. And it's not really like, it's not coming out of exactly what people need. And this has to be a very organic, open conversation of like, listen, this is what we can offer. What are exactly your needs? And one thing that needs to be changed now is also how we, as international organizations in general as well, look at uh, local organizations that their, all, their advocacy messages are always weak. Like we are not the benchmark. We need to understand this. Like this is not a comparing game. We need to understand that each of us plays a different role. And I don't think international organizations should, should really come in looking at local organizations as weaker, because then you're trying to really get them to be a replica of you. And this is where the blurred lines come of like you're creating replicas of yourself and other INGOs, and you're not really dividing roles. And for me, this is very, very problematic when you're trying to, you know, make everybody just like you. We need to understand that this is about complementarity, but also this is about understanding, you know, our limitations and lines and where do we stand and where do local organizations stand and make sure that we're very transparent and like this is what we can offer and like we... If we can protect them, amazing. If we can't, we need to say this because I find it sometimes problematic when international organizations put local activists or uh, organizations in the front line when it serves them. And this is not okay. We really need to be more mindful. So in conclusion, what I'm trying to say is that maybe before we even think about supporting um, local humanitarian-led advocacy, maybe we need to think if that support is actually hindering them or stopping them. And you know what? Maybe we need to learn from them. And maybe we need to be, you know, maybe we need to get lessons from them or be told on how to do things instead of assuming always that we need to dictate 
you know, how they work. And also sometimes we need to understand that we are not mindful when it comes to localization. Omar, can I Well, just uh, thank you um, just for the sake of time? I think your intervention is super important. And I see all the speakers uh, nodding uh, in agreement. And, and, and it's really about listening and everything that you have uh, said. I would take in another hand that we see, um, uh, I think it is from uh, Mahmoud. Um, I think, Mahmoud, you're from Lawyers and Doctors for Human Rights. I see next to your name also Syria. So, Mahmoud, if you um, can tell us also what uh, you think uh, briefly before we move to our very exciting Mentimeter question. So, can I speak in Arabic or in English? So it's... ايه فيك تحكي بالعربي لانه بعتقد انه في ترجمة شكرا جزيلا انا فرصة ج... فرصة Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to participate and to share with you the different context. Today I'm speaking based on the Syrian experience and the region, neighboring region that is Lebanon, Palestine, Sudan, Yemen and the other devastated countries in the Arab region. For the Syrian context and the during the 13 years of uh, conflicts and the humanitarian and the human rights issues, one of the main issues that we have faced uh, in uh, concerning uh, the protection. Here I'm talking about uh, the Syrian context. In fact, the issue of uh, protection is uh, has been separated from the issue of uh, human rights. And uh, we have faced this, especially uh, with the international NGOs. And here, when we talk about INGOs. In fact, the problem is also with the main donors and the UN agencies uh, whose, uh, whose work usually when they move from uh, Middle East, from Africa, from Asia, usually they have the same mindset uh, and they uh, only, uh, their work is a copy paste with uh, minor, uh, minor modifications. In fact, uh, uh, their work uh, uh, their work lacks experience in our region. Uh, the other uh, uh, problem that uh, we as uh, a local organization face is the issue of uh, localization and uh, the uh, localization of uh, experiences and funding and the lack of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, real partners. The problem is that uh, with the lack of experience and uh, localization, localization of expertise uh, and uh, Usually, the experiences are being stolen from the local organizations and considered as and taken by the INGOs. That is why the donors should learn and the UN agencies should learn how to deal with local organizations and not make the issue of localization as a mere marketing issue. So uh, today uh, we see that international organizations and UN agencies, and we see that uh, the financing is done through them. And, uh, and the uh, communities uh, 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 are not trusting uh, these international organizations anymore because uh, they see or they hear that, for example, there are $2 billion uh, in aid that uh, came to Syria. But uh, in fact, nothing reaches the people. Yes. In fact, local uh, local organizations uh, uh, do uh, have uh, organize, uh, do have experience in human uh, humanitarian issues and uh, human rights, and uh, today. Uh, we have uh, more uh, experience. Do we then need uh, for more localization and sustainability? So, uh, sorry for being uh, uh, 
too long, but uh, in fact, this gap should be filled. And what is also more important is not to, to divide the uh, civil uh, uh, to, it's important not to divide the work of civil service institutions that provide the humanitarian work from the work of human rights institution, because both the work should be, should be complementary. And we need also to raise to raise awareness in our uh, society, and we see that uh, some organizations uh, say that uh, international organizations say that uh, we will not be funding this or that organization because they don't work on uh, uh, advocacy, etc. So, uh, thank you. How are we defining community-led protection advocacy and? Uh, maybe one thing that also came up a lot in the discussions that we've had between the advocacy working group and the community-led protection task team is that communities do not have specific mandates or restrictions as a result of mandates like organizations do so they can talk about human rights issues, they can talk about protection issues, they can talk about different um, issues and advocate uh, uh, for uh, the improvement of their situation without being stuck in these um, boxes. So thank you, uh, Mahmoud, for highlighting some of these things. We will jump directly now to the uh, Mentimeter uh, um, that uh, we have that prepared for you. And I think already we have a lot that has been said uh, uh, on that uh, question uh, specifically, but uh, please feel free to uh, say what uh, um, you have uh, to say about how can we avoid um, that external organizations support to community-led protection advocacy efforts does not take away the grassroots nature of this action and does not turn the community into an NGO-like entities. Or what we have been talking about, like how can we avoid NGOizing these efforts? And I think some of our speakers and our interveners from the audience said that we should not make anyone look like us or fit a certain mold that we have uh, prepared a priori or in different contexts. I can see some of the things uh, coming uh, up. We have 331 participants. I think that we uh, will get a lot of uh, tips that we would also love to include in uh, um, the outcome of this session so we can share beyond um, this specific uh, session. Paying attention to local culture, Listening, I think uh, today's theme is uh, listening. Contextualizing efforts. And really perhaps an understanding of the protection uh, situation and the protection risks, echoing what uh, Lauren has uh, mentioned and important resources like the uh, protection trends report of uh, Civic that she's mentioned. Transparency and accountability, use of the bottom-up approach, building long-term relationships. I think someone called Adriana in the audience had said that we need to be process-oriented, not project-oriented. Engagement with different types of uh, stakeholders. This is what the community can do. Um, better than uh, anyone else, as our speakers have uh, mentioned, that they know their context, they know the risks, they know the stakeholders, they know what can have an impact. Respect local needs, creating safe spaces and building relationships. So I'm going to add to listening another uh, important word for today that is trust and having this relationship of um, 
acceptance and trust, not uh, parachuting suddenly with a lot of ideas. I think there was a lot of passion from Mahmoud and Omar on this uh, very specific uh, topic. Complementarity with the community, of course, complementarity with the communities and how we can not duplicate or change their uh, way of doing things, imposing something on them, but rather uh, complement and support what is already there and what they think is working and works best for them. Alors, uh, il y a un commentaire que j'aime... There is a comment that I like a lot that is involve communities in advocacy effort. Back to something that we have mentioned at the very beginning is that there are different types and different contexts. So also, how can we have a community-led protection advocacy at all levels, not only at the local levels, but supporting such type of community-led protection advocacy um, at different uh, levels, not only through social media, but also I think Jihan and Sara mentioned something about giving up power and opening up the space. Maybe amplifying what is already there and is being said rather than creating something on organic. Okay, thank you very much. These are amazing ideas for our uh, menti uh, meter question. I think there are so many ideas. Many people are seeing how things might not be uh, 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 um, or that we can do much more in certain uh, spheres and uh, the experience is being uh, shared. Now, this idea of capturing impact or successes is difficult for everyone, including international organizations, UN agencies. When we talk about advocacy, it's always there is what is meal for advocacy? How do we capture success? So it's there are also challenges for communities when they are doing advocacy. How do they uh, know that their uh, uh, efforts were successful and impactful? Um, and uh, Augustin, I would like to hear from you on the different engagements that you have that we've highlighted uh, in, in the past and uh, today in the different examples you've provided, how do you think the communities can capture uh, and see the success and impact of their actions? Merci toujours Yasmin parce que les Yasmin because the population comment ils peuvent capitaliser les impacts Thank you how could they aussi, uh, capitalize the impacts of examples. their actions we have uh, various examples in that matter we were saying that uh, after the capacity building we should give à ces membres des communautés more possibilities for the members of the community to develop uh, monitoring tools and uh, evaluation tools. So when they have those tools, this could allow them to carry out correctly their activities. Apart from those tools, M&E tools, they have to uh, support them because if we continue building their capacity, it will help community members to analyze themselves. I was also saying that for this community to be committed, it should be able to elaborate or identify all the problems and risks they are facing and also develop a kind of matrix of uh, protection incidents that will occur. So when they are able to analyze, they can go wherever they want and discuss this issue of uh, community protection. With all capacity, capacity building activities and analysis, the populations are well ahead and uh, 
a really dynamic with regards to advocacy issues and uh, analysis of security context. So that's what I could add. Thank you. Thank you so much, Augusta. Our four amazing other stars, uh, if they want to add anything. In the meantime, I will ask the audience, the participants, I'm calling you audience because it's a talk show. You can write in the um, chat box all the ideas that you have because this is really a um, sphere where we can, or an area where we can uh, improve a lot. Lena, I see uh, your hand uh, is, is up. Hey. Yes, Jasmine, thank you very much. As to what Augustin said, I think that uh, for communities to be able to measure their impact, it's necessary that during the strengthening process, they can also have access to the monitoring and the follow-up tools. This is what they it will uh, use in order to know or measure that impact. And I think that one of the ways to be able to measure that impact is this one. If communities uh, articulate and uh, work with the government, local government, with other organizations uh, uh, that are on the ground, uh, if they uh, do or use simple tools like, like uh, surveys uh, in order to perceive changes in the risk, protection risk situations or other, um, let's say, topics such as the uh, drop in the occurrence of uh, risks or threats. If they are able to uh, set baselines uh, in order to prevent any risky situation, well, uh, this will help us, will help them. And finally, as Augustin said, uh, communities can measure success and impact uh, if they're able to understand, uh, analyze, and deeply recognize and acknowledge risks, threats, and if they are also aware of the capacities they have as communities. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, Lina. Very important uh, points and a super important also comment uh, from the chat where uh, from uh, Ms. From uh, sorry, I cannot read the first name, but the family name is Valois, where they're saying that people would be the agents of the process, agents of their own change. So this idea of uh, agency, um, Jihan and uh, Sara, I see you are uh, also um, nodding, but uh, please feel free um, to say uh, something or we can. Okay, uh, what I need to say is that uh, we do not uh, want to strengthen the, com the community to learn our, our tools and our monitoring tools and our evaluation to tools. We need, I think the word here is flexibility. We need to go out to the community and see how naturally they uh, 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 evaluate success and impact. Impact... Uh, <laughs> It takes time, and it's good that it takes time. Uh, communities are not uh, molded, or they, they are they, they do not have a tight schedule. They give the, uh, their time, or they give time to to see the impact or to see the success, which is good. Uh, because uh, us NGOs, I, I and I NGOs, we do not work like that. We need to see the impact within our uh, schedule. So yes, so we need to be more flexible. We need to make more changes. Uh, as uh, the context is uh, changing, um, I guess advocacy pays off really when the community and all uh, components of the community can engage with, uh, like I said before, power holders, both knowing, yani, the, uh, all power holders and the community, they both know their duties and their influence. Okay, so and to work and to work together toward the, the interest of the community. Thank you very much, uh, Sara. And maybe it echoes some of the discussions happening in the chat where people are asking who is doing the advocacy, uh, who is designing and leading um, and uh, 
these are all questions that will also depend or that will also determine the timing and how much time communities have if it's a immediate risk or a longer term process uh, for change policy reform perhaps um, and this is where uh, impact is differently uh, measured many interesting comments uh, in the chat and I leave our speakers uh, to read them very quickly. And if anyone would like to um, comment, uh, Lina, Augustin, Jehan, Lauren, Jehan and Sara. Sorry, I am uh, just reading the name from, uh, but it's Jehan and Sara. Great. I think that uh, um, measuring impact is challenging, but as we can see from this very interesting discussion and uh, uh, contributions from our uh, speakers, there are, uh, um, if you want, uh, uh, actions that could be taken. There is a role uh, or there could be a role for organizations to play to support also communities in looking at the different milestones and what change means uh, um, to them. Uh, so it's very visible in the in the um, uh, chat, listening, trust, agency, understanding the context themes that are coming out of um, the different discussions that uh, we had uh, today. So as we close, I want to first thank very much our speakers, Lina, Augustin, Lauren, and uh, Jihan, and Sara, because this has been super interesting. And I really hope that everyone um, found it uh, useful and interesting. We heard a lot from the participants, we heard a lot from the speakers, and we are hoping to really take this discussion uh, forward in the advocacy working group and the community led protection task team to be able to link this knowledge of protection trends, protection contexts, but also work on uh, um, the ground. Any questions to our speakers, burning questions at the end to our really amazing speakers i i cannot see if uh, there is a hand i'm sorry but um there is a question about uh the a question about the how to connect all this to measuring uh, risks, etc. So I think also as the organizations you're working in, you are all not only working to support community-led protection advocacy, but you have um, different uh, activities uh, under uh, community-led uh, protection. So maybe how do these different activities uh, come uh, together? Augustin, Lina, Jehan, Sarah, Lauren. I'm not sure, Jehan, if you are speaking, but because we... No. <coughs> yes, Augustin, s'il vous plaît. Oui, euh, je, voulais, je voulais juste apporter une, une petite réponse. Parce well, I have dit... something to say regarding uh, the, question, the question. The question was very long. You talked about the protection. Uh, I don't. I didn't know if it was uh, community based or something else. This is exactly what we were saying. Protection. The base community protection is the protection. You know, at the level of communities, there are volunteers that make up the structure, and they are already uh, including part of the population in what they are doing, and they are, they are holding meetings with the communities, even though they are representative of the community at one point as a structure, the population, population needs to be informed that there's a new situation or this or that is happening. And when they are informed, 
ils reviennent comme la redevance. They come back to the population and present what are the different approaches. So this is what I can say. But to me, uh, I didn't uh, get the question very well because it was very long. Augusta, uh, as you are unmuted already, there's a question uh, directly to you um, about uh, the intervention that you made oui. about the different discussions. And maybe also, uh, Lauren, uh, you mentioned uh, some of these uh, uh, aspects. Uh, but Augusta, in the RC, how are you managing the risks? Uh, for the communities or supporting them to manage the risks when there is this civil military relationship or encounter and proximity. Uh, this is a relevant question. And the question touch it on the community because if you try to understand the communities in which we intervene first they are divided and when they are divided they can't be easily accessed accessed and and in all communities we have all these people with they are moderate people and it's only through the moderate people that we can uh, identify and when identified they can support in the training they can support and how we proceed so they help uh, uh, bring together all the communities let me give you the example of what's happening in kigoma uh, plate this is in bovima you will see the Bayange community and the other population is towards the western part and there's no access but with this community structure the community lead can go there and discuss and open corridors with all the communities and once we have these corridors open the population can now exchange and they try to set up measures for the living together and here you can see the population doing something all together so that peace can exist another example in the previous years 2023 the population in Koko kaolo uh, didn't go out and it's only through the moderate people that we could see the suffering of the others and it's only through them that uh, we were able to do something and I would like to recommend to the organizers of this forum just to tell them there's, there's a long-term job that the organizations assisting the communities need to do. And we need to also think about how to build up this link, this relation with the communities to work on the peaceful coexistence. Because if, even if us as organization can uh, have sessions, if there's no peace within the communities, at the end, there won't be any visible impact in the communities. But if we just leave the communities act on their own i think the impact will also be visible sometimes there are stories that totally change and gradually we can see the change uh, day by day this is the only thing i could add to this question thank you I see a hand that has been raised a couple of times. I'm sorry, uh, Eugène. Okay, uh, merci beaucoup. Moi, je suis Eugène. Well, thank you. I am Eugène. I am in Northern Kivu, where 
conflicts occur. But I wanted to say something on community protection because this is one of the activities that we are doing with our partners, where most of the international actors uh, seem to have uh, abandoned the population when the region was taken over by the rebels in 2023. Now, we are here with uh, our activities and for the community protection. We organize awareness, uh, we meet with communities, and these activities facilitate the collaboration because the, the, the community is able to bring answers to their own problems. Uh, regarding the coexistence or the living together. Désolé, Eugène, je ne crois pas que je sais pas si c'est moi ou les autres. Si vous pouvez pas. I don't know if you can also hear uh, Eugène, but he seems to have a problem with the internet connection. Désolé. Les acteurs ont quitté la zone et la les communautés. Well, as I was saying, the actors left the area, so there are many problems. We have uh, arrestations, uh, some people who are internally displaced and targeted as uh, criminals. And in addition to that, we also organize community meetings between the host community and the residing community. Now they can discuss and live together peacefully. Thank you, Eugène. This is very, very useful. Also, Eugène completed the, the, the theme with why we need uh, to ensure the support to community-led protection advocacy. As our speaker said it, and Eugène did a better conclusion than uh, myself uh, as um, uh, uh, the facilitator of the talk show to say that we need to support this because it's more sustainable. They know better. He said that at some point, international actors will no longer be there and um, as he explained that now there is a real need for support for uh, community uh, protection and they will be the ones there uh, uh, to um, claim their rights to negotiate access to um, uh, ensure their protection and that of their uh, families and communities. So thank you, Eugène. And uh, we came to uh, the last minute of our session today. Thank you for everyone. I think this is the best talk show with 300 people that I have ever facilitated. So thank you very much. And thank you to our speakers, Lina, Lauren, Augustin, Jehan, and uh, Sara, and to all the people who posted in the chat, hoping that we will have uh, more follow-ups on this uh, very uh, important topic. Thank you very much, and please do fill the Mentimeter before you leave the chat.